So, when I was a kid, what I really liked to do during summer was to tackle on these giant ass RPGs. These were the kind of games that I couldn't never chew my way through um, if it wasn't during the summer holidays. Because I would always be at school doing sports, so I would only have a few hours every day to play video games. And so I would just never be able to keep up with these massive 80 hour games. And even as I sort of started my education and got older and all that stuff, I still looked forward to summer so I could just really play a long ass video game. But this summer I don't actually have any summer vacation, but I still want to chew my way through a video game. And I also want to do kind of a different video that from what I usually do, a uh, sort of more off the cuff avant-garde thing. That is why there is no script for this. That is why I am having trouble coming up with words to say with my mouth. But I did prepare something. I prepared... Oh, he's right now. Yeah, I prepared... This. Shadow of Memory. This is a game that I remember seeing when I was like 15 and I was just sort of getting into that part of my life where I kind of wanted to be an uh, emo and have black hair, but I never really totally delved into it. But I always wanted to get this game and I never did. And that's actually kind of a shame because I only wanted to get this game because it looked kind of cool from the cover alone. But it turns out that it's actually um, a lot like one of my favorite games. Actually, like a lot like two of my favorite games but one of my favorite games at the time which was Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask because similarly this also features a um, sort of plot that starts at the end and then you have to work your way backwards. What happens in this game is that you are a man named Ike spelled E-I-K-E -E, and the game starts as you are killed and then you have to travel back in time because you get this device and you have to prevent your death by altering small things in various time periods but it's separated into 10 individual chapters and I figured that while I'm busy at work this summer that I would play one chapter each day which is also why my shirt will hopefully change from day one to day two to day three and so on and if it doesn't that means I wore the same fucking shirt that day or I want just like it I actually have a lot of these that I made myself and there was also a red one that I have like a ton of. Um, you can see the emblem here. That's the island, island I live on. Yeah. That's the paradise place you are so used to seeing in my outros. And so yeah, we're gonna play this and we're gonna play one chapter each day. And I'm gonna film myself. So this is actually gonna be a let's play. That's gonna be a thing that I will do. And I'm gonna film, film, film myself laying on this couch that's full of hair because I haven't had time to clean my apartment. My apartment is absolutely full of dog hair and uh, flower petals for some fucking reason. And just generally like super dusty. Because I'd rather, I rather be making YouTube videos and doing work than I want to vacuum and clean. Actually, I'm gonna clean today, later on. But for now, let's play some Shadow of Memories. And join me on this epic journey that I'm calling 10 Days of Summer in the Shadow of Memories. Also, this is of course a pink piece too. Okay, so what happened in the prologue was that Ike walks down a alley after he has exited a cafe and then gets stabbed by a shadowy figure. He then wakes up in a realm that's sort of outside of time and uh, here a mysterious voice gives him a digipad which is a thing that he can use to rewind time and like and go to different time periods so that he can prevent the thing that caused his death the way he then then what we did were that i ran around town for a while and i talked to a bunch of townspeople and then i found a fortune teller the fortune teller then pointed me in the direction that the alley where i got stabbed in the killer couldn't kill me there or rather kill Ike there if I gathered a group of people. So I went back in time from um, 1407, uh, which is uh, the murder happens at 1430. So I went back to 1330 
Then I talked an old lady into going and seeing a juggling show at the uh, at the town square. And then I told a daughter who was looking for her mother and the mother who was looking for the daughter independently of each other that they would both be at the town square. And after I talked to them, the digipad then uh, did a little bleepy 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 thing. And so I traveled back to 1407 and there actually was a uh, juggling show going on. And I guess they were just on a break before when I was running around uh, town trying to figure out stuff and so I watched the juggling show um, and then a shadow sort of approached me and then because there was a crowd of people who were watching along with uh, Ike and I guess me the player uh, the shadow figure then stepped back and that's the end of the prologue chapter what's gonna happen now is that we are gonna go back to the fortune teller because the fortune teller what what she did was that before we gathered the group of people she um she predicted that uh, she predicted one outcome and because we changed things her prediction will change so now we need to go back and see what the what her next prediction is and then go and try and prevent that and I'm guessing from here on out, the next nine uh, instances of this gotta be gradually more and more complicated. I'm, I'm guessing by chapter 10 we're gonna see a lot of really convoluted stuff and we're gonna see a lot of like puzzles and have to get a lot of things aligned. Sort of like in the Hitman games. The Hitman games are probably the, uh, the closest comparison I can see to this right now. Because in some of the later levels in the Hitman games you need to get maybe sometimes if you need if you need if you want to use the environmental kills in hitman um, and still get the silent assassin ranking which is the rank where you execute your mark without being um, spotted or whatever you need to perform I think it's like eight steps in some of the in, in some of the games and some of the little levels to sort of do that domino effect that sort of butterfly effect thing uh, and get away with it and I'm guessing this is gonna be the same because Ike was gonna get killed at 14.30 and we started the game at 14. Um, what I had to do here was just simply to walk up to the fortune teller who would then tell me to gather a crowd. And the only obstacle was... Uh, I shouldn't touch my other time self, which I did because I was an idiot. <laughs> I went into the cafe and I was like, oh, that dude who's sleeping, he kind of looks like Ike a little bit. And then I went over and then I touched him and then it was game over and I actually had to redo the prologue. It's kind of everything I wanted it to be. It's um, I literally played for 10 minutes and I am so into it. I, I really dig the gameplay. I really dig that it takes place in, I'm guessing, Austria. Um, because it has, uh, it has like weird, instead of English, I guess it's Deutschenese. Um, because all the street names are like very, uh, there's just something odd about them. Like, there's not a lot of places in real life in Germany or Austria that are just called Hauptstraße, which means Main Street. That's just not, you don't call things in English Main Street. I, well, I guess you do in English, but you don't really do it in in like Northern Europe. It's always called the town name and then Main Street. Uh, but here it's just called Main Street. It's just called Hauptstraße. Um, I guess it, it does do... Kirchenstraße is sort of right if the, ch if the town only has one church. Which is actually really uncommon in Europe, because um, like I live in a town with, uh, well, I live on an island with 1,800 people, and we actually just have five churches uh, spread out over three towns, and there were even like smaller micro churches. So basically, in Europe, um, instead of these historical parts of Europe, you're gonna have a church per 200 people, because back in the day, you would churches would hold about 200 people. So if you had a town with 2,000 people, you would have and churches but it's sort of it's it's all completely wrong but it's completely wrong in an extremely endearing way and i really love that it takes place in austria that's fun i guess it takes place in germany maybe we'll find out it's sun some whatever it is and that's all i have to say about the prologue i will see you tomorrow well it will be tomorrow for me it will be 10 seconds for you It is Tuesday, June 2nd. And we are gonna continue with the... The, um, 
the delicious little game known as Shadow of Memory. Ah, you are still in danger. Okay, so that was chapter one. Because in Japan games, prologue is always chapter zero, and so this is chapter one. And in chapter one, we come back from stopping our own murder by the shadow, and then we go back to the fortune teller, who tells us that the death date for when we are gonna die has been moved up to 15 o'clock. Then, as we head back out, we realize that a church is on fire. I, of course, tried to get into the church, but then I died. So I went back in time to before the fire started, and then I actually interrupted the guy who was starting the fire, and so he didn't start the fire. And that's that's chapter one. This is supposedly a four hour long game. Um, so I'm guessing that some of the later chapters are gonna be a bit longer. And because um, this is supposed to be 10, and we are through two of them, and the playtime for now is 10 minutes total. But I guess we'll see that tomorrow. So yeah, I will... Um, I will see you tomorrow, but you will see me in 10 seconds. It is Wednesday the 3rd of June, and um, I... I was very, very, very close to actually cheating and uh, just pretending that the days were going forwards and forwards and forwards and just change my clothing to reflect each day. Then I was a big idiot and made the mistake of including the phone date um, in yesterday's shot. So I figured it would be too, too much work to uh, to go through the hoops of tricking my phone into thinking that it was another day. But um, now it is another day and I'm excited to play more Shadow of Memories. So uh, yeah, let's play more Shadow of Memories. I'm really hoping that we'll get to play for more than five minutes, but you know, let's see. Well, fantastic. That was um, quite a bit more of a meaty chapter than the previous two, clocking in at about 30-50 minutes. And it also saw us like, really use the time travel power to actually change things. As in this chapter, um, Dana, the waitress from the restaurant, runs up to Ike and she has this big ruby that she asks him if it's his, and obviously it's not because it's like this huge. Um, but she also has a lighter which is his, and he takes that. However, while they are talking, Ike actually gets stabbed by uh, the killer who's now hiding behind a tree in the town square. So he gets killed, then travels back to the time before it happened. The killing happens at 15.30, so he travels back to 15.10, then he runs up to the waitress, which will buy him about 20 minutes to talk to her at the town square before he gets murdered. At the town square, he, of course, after talking to her, uh, has a little bit of time, so he travels back in time and finds out that the time travel device actually generates a field, so he accidentally also takes Dana with him into the past to uh, the year 15.80 where he has to, to stop the tree from actually getting sprouted or getting planted or whatever. So he does that and he runs into either the alchemist, the fortune teller herself, or a uh, sort of uh, or an ascendant of the fortune teller that we are constantly talking to in the year 2001. Um, we sort of learn that there's some family issues and her brother actually very... her brother actually guesses that Ike is a time traveler. I don't know if it's because Ike is the only one who's not sepia tone or um, whatever it is, but he, he guesses it. Um, that story for it doesn't really go anywhere now. I'm sure that that's gonna be something that's picked up later. So anyways, Ike leaves and um, he finds a ladder and uh, at the Times Square we actually see a person who is about to plant the tree that the killer will hide behind 400 years from now. Um, Ike sort of tries to convince him that he should just, you know, not plant the tree, but he only uh, responds to the squire who's sort of like the lord of the town. So uh, what Ike does is 
is that he goes up to the Lord's Manor and uh, at the Lord's Manor there is a guard outside the gate and he will give Ike the key but he asks him to trade for something. And Ike trades a photograph that I can't remember where I got, uh, which lets him inside. And then inside the crest on the manor house where the Lord lives is loose. So Ike uses the ladder that he found earlier to get the crest and then heads back to uh, the town square and shows the planter man the crest and says, you know, you gotta plant flowers instead. After that, the time travel device thingy blinks and uh, then Ike travels back in time to 2001 where Dana, of course, isn't because he he just kind of left her in the, in the past. I, I did search for her a bit, but um, I could only find one villager to talk to, and he didn't know where she was, so, you know, lost cause. And also the the cafe where she... I, I figured she might run back to the cafe where she, she had worked at 400 years in the future, but it hasn't actually been built yet, which was kind of a neat little thing. Um, so I traveled back into the present time, and in the present time uh, there was of course no killer hiding behind the tree, because there was no tree, there was a nice little flower bed. And that's where that chapter ended. Now we have to sit out and find the waitress. Somehow in the past, even though we are in the present. Um, it was nice playing this chapter, which has a little more, more meat on. I can, I can sort of sustain myself until tomorrow on this little bit of tidbit, and I can sort of analyze it, and then I, I think that's cool. Um, now, I enjoy the way that I set this little experiment up. Uh, the first two days were like really rough because it was five minutes of gameplay and it was it was it was juicy, but it wasn't enough. It was like um, it was like those finger food samples at the supermarket that you really like, but it wasn't a full course meal. This chapter is a full course meal, and uh, I should stop talking about it because in ten seconds you are gonna experience the next chapter. But for me, it will be tomorrow. Until then. No, not until. I will see you. Okay, cool. It is... The... 4th of June. And, um... That will be the fourth day because I started on the 1st of June. And um, let's play another chapter of Shadow of Memories. So in this chapter, Ike then gets a vase dropped on his face and then dies. Then he travels back in time. And he gets called up by a guy at a museum that he apparently had an appointment with that he forgot about. So he rushes over the, to the museum, talks to that guy, and after finishing talking to him, he walks downstairs and meets uh, the homunculi, which is the time voice that we have been meeting every time that we have died. The time voice uh, has to display their power uh, uh, for Ike to be convinced that they are the time voice. So Ike is sent back to 1979 and he's actually sent back on the day that uh, the man that he met at the museum's daughter was born in uh, and his name is Dr. Eckhart. No, not Dr. Eckhart. His name is Mr. Eckhart. You're Mr. Eckhart? I get thrown back in time to 1979 on the day that Mr. Eckhart's daughter is born. Mr. Eckhart is the guy who owns the museum. And we're then stuck in 1979 without a digipad. And we sort of have to find our way back. And um, I just sort of wandered around town. And I found some time energy or whatever it's called, which actually just powered the digipad. And then we went back to the present. And in the present, we confronted Mr. Eckhart about whether or not he had a daughter or has a daughter. Turns out he had a daughter, but she got kidnapped and his wife actually got killed pretty much right after we met him in 1979. Um, he's so startled because he's never mentioned towards Ike that he has a daughter. So he tips the vase over. And so we actually 
stops our death, I guess, again. And then we walk downstairs and the humunculi talks a little bit and then asks us that if uh, we come across that red gem that the waitress had, who's definitely Mr. Eckhart's daughter, if we come across that, we need to retrieve it and give it to a doctor called Dr. Wagner. And um, that's the end of that. The humunculi pretty much just goes squabbly squabbly and disappears behind a pillar and then the chapter ends. Um, yeah, it's getting like super exciting. Um, I can tell from howlongsbeat.com that we still have about three and a half hours left. So the chapter is only gonna get, or mostly gonna get longer. This one was a little bit shorter than the one yesterday, but uh, it was still 16 minutes. I can sort of guess too that one of the chapters is probably gonna be really long, like an hour. So we've got six left. So they, the others are at least gonna be 30 minutes each on average, but I'm gonna guess that one of them is gonna be an hour, probably the final one. Um, and maybe also a middle one from there. And then we're gonna have a couple of short 15 minutes uh, chapters like this one this seems like the ideal length for a chapter at least for from how I play it because there's a lot of information and you have to keep track of a lot of things I've been having an easy time getting through the game but I imagine that it's actually pretty easy to get stuck if you don't pay attention to your surroundings and remember all the things you need to remember and um, the game doesn't help you at any point with remembering all this stuff you just sort of have to. And if you play it in one sitting, you're probably gonna end up playing for longer because you can't contain all the time periods and all that stuff in your head. The same way that I can do it doing it this way because I have an entire day to sort of... to sort of feast on the excellence that is this game. To eat it like... Like a good apple, the little little bites, little chunks of gameplay, and it makes me think and it makes me analyze and it makes me remember. And I think this is probably the ideal way to actually play a game like this. And I guess that is also kind of why it is structured like the way it is. is. And it is apparently a game that you need to think about because it got a 5 out of 5. And there's a little thing that says that it's a thinking man's masterpiece. And that sounds kind of pretentious, but I actually... I totally agree. It is. I think if you are an idiot, it's gonna be really hard. So yeah, um, I will see you tomorrow, and you will see me in 10 seconds. Cool. Good day. It is the 5th of June. And the 5th day that we are doing this. And um, we're halfway through with the days, but we actually still have three hours of gameplay left. So I am genuinely very excited about the, uh, the coming few days. Because I think we're gonna see some really cool stuff with the... Uh, with the humunculi. And I was listening to the soundtrack yesterday, so I also know that we are gonna go to the early 1900s, because uh, uh, there, there's, uh, there are two tracks labeled that. So yes, very excited. Let's, uh, let's get into it. <laughs> That was chapter 5, and it was, um, the time of the murder has now been moved to about 19, and so Ike gets stabbed outside the cafe at that hour. Um, the homunculi then, in the sort of jokingly says that he should get a, a steel plate to cover himself with so he can survive the stabbing. Then he goes back to, um, 1902, and there he meets the guy who is the descendant of the squire, whose uh, mansion we sort of broke into in the 1500s and the ascendant of the museum owner in 2001. The guy is actually about to sell the mansion because both his parents and his wife has just died and he's left with two children and it's a too big of a house. And Ike is the one that actually suggests that he should, should turn it into a museum, which is why it actually gets turned into a museum in 2001. Now you're probably thinking, well, is this sort of a um, time-traveling destiny tale? And I think so. Because 
Inside the mansion, the Neo Museum man is about to have a family picture with his two children. So he goes off to fetch the photographer. While that is happening, Ike talks to the older girl who then spots that Ike has a sort of th a thing with his shirt or a jacket or whatever. And um, she says that she will repair it for him. So he takes it off, but it's very cold. So she tells him to go put on her father's festival costume because there's an upcoming festival. The upcoming festival costume is actually the Juggler's outfit that we saw in 2001. So Ike then heads back to 2001 to around 1410. And then he actually is the one that starts juggling. But this time, he has this Fabergé egg with a note inside that he then throws to other Ike who is observing the, the juggling man. And inside the egg, uh, in, in the note, he tells the Ike that is watching the juggling that he needs to pick up a frying pan because he saw a frying pan earlier when he went to a bar at some point, which I can't remember. Anyways, um, juggling man Ike then heads back to 1902 where the girl Sibylla is done mending his jacket and when he puts on the jacket the frying pan falls out so then he goes back to 2001 and he gets stabbed because I forgot that I needed to equip the frying pan in order for him not to die so I had to repeat it all over, um, which doesn't actually take a lot of time. It doesn't take a lot of time to repeat these things in the game because a lot of the game is cutscenes and cutscenes except for the one that has you traveling through time because of those loading screens can actually be skipped. So it took about, I don't know, a minute to repeat that entire sequence that I just mentioned. So yeah, I then that time equipped the frying pan and then I got stabbed, but the frying pan saved him. So he goes on to live another half hour. It's starting to get really, really interesting. Um, and I don't know, it's a fun little daily tradition to sit down, play one chapter, and then, um, then try and say words about that chapter without having written words to read from. I have a theory that the killer is Ike himself and that Ike is the one that makes the homunculi. Yeah, I don't have a lot of a lot of stuff to say because uh, this was sort of a well self-contained chapter. It starts out with uh, a murdering and then Ike prevents the murdering and then it of course references a bunch of stuff that happened earlier like watching the juggling man and I actually remember playing that chapter and, and having questions as to why there was a juggling man because I get the sense that everyone that's sort of in town at that moment and at any moment can be interacted with and I didn't interact with the juggling man and I sort of actually, you know, I ran around the entire town and I went into every building that I could go into and I thought it was even weirder that the juggling man wasn't waiting together with the, with the weird girl and I thought it was even weirder weirder that she didn't reference the juggling man. I just, I just kind of sort of assumed that she was some kind of circus person but I guess she was just a plain old weirdo. <laughs> Yes, so it is the 6th of June. And we are of course gonna be playing yet another chapter. And I'm excited. So that was yet another chapter and in this chapter Ike comes back to the past and it's now fairly late, it's about 20.30. He is incredibly hungry because he hasn't eaten since he left the cafe earlier that day at around 14 and has kind of just, you know, been avoiding getting killed all this time. So he goes to a bar to get food. And this is one of these things that annoys me a little bit because in German a bar is typically not a place where you buy food. It is a place where you drink horrible beer and listen to even more horrible music and get hit on by middle-aged uh, Austrian women. Um, a bar where you can get something to eat would be more of an inn or a tavern. But anyways, he goes to this bar and he orders 
the delicious dish, meat and vegetables. Um, and that gets poisoned and then he dies. He then finds out that he got poisoned by a, something called sea hair poison. And he has to get the antidote for sea hair poison. Sea hair poison comes from a female sea hair. And the antidote comes from a male sea hair, sea hair. The problem is that because Ike went back to the 1900s and told Mr. Eckhart to turn his mansion into a art museum, it didn't become a library. So what Ike does instead is that he travels back to 1902 and convinces Mr. Eckhart to turn it into a library. And while also there, he talks to Sindula, who uh, is very lonely. He then travels to the modern day to speak with the modern Mr. Eckhart and gets one of the kittens that Mr. Eckhart just got. And then he gives that to Cindilla, Cindilla or whatever her name is. And he travels uh, back to the present and goes to the narrow library where he finds out that he needs the sea hair antidote, the male sea hair antidote. But he also finds out that in 2001 that species is extinct. So the interesting thing is obviously that he got uh, poisoned with a poison from a, a an extinct animal. But the other interesting point is that we actually have to go back to the 1500s and talk to the alchemist. However, when we arrive at the alchemist, his lab has just blown up and there's a dog guarding his door so we can't get in. But we go to the butcher shop where she gives us some meat which we then use to lure the dog away and we enter the house. In the house everyone is of course dead or blown up or whatever but we find a key. We then travel two years back in time to, 80, to 1582 where the house is not blown up yet. Normally we wouldn't be able to go into the basement because we don't have a key and it's locked. But we picked up the key two years in the future in the blown up mansion so we can actually enter the basement. And there we learn that um, the alchemist man, Dr. something, is in the process of making a humunculi. The interesting thing about the humunculi is that he actually needs the philosopher's stone, which is the red ruby that the humunculi has been looking for outside of time. Um, so now we have even more of a reason to go track down that waitress lady who got stuck in time because we got her stuck in time. And she's by the way been stuck here for two years and Ike, he's not really taking super much of an interest in it. Um, anyways, he uh, he says to the alchemist that yeah, he'll, he'll get him the philosopher's stone, blah 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 blah. And then when he leaves, it actually gets really fucking interesting because the sort of young girl lady person who uh, who we first encountered when we visited two years ago from her point of view then cops on, comes up and talks to us and she actually has male sea hair poison antidote thing that she then just gives to us and then we talk to her and we sort of learn that um, that her brother figured out that we were time travelers and that she's the only one that released him and we also sort of learn that she might be Ike's uh, ancestor which is also really interesting. And they sort of talk and he tells her interesting things about the future, which is uh, totally not a bad idea, right? And they sort of go on errands and on while on an errand, uh, Ike actually sees that waitress person run away, but he can't catch up to her. Anyways, they sort of get back to the... After they are done running the errands, they get back to the house. They talk to like the weird boy Hugo, who's a little bit feminine um, in the way he speaks. I can't tell if he's supposed to be just, you know, a high-strung nerd, or if he's supposed to be gay, or if he's supposed to be annoying, because he has sort of a combination of all those three stereotypical voices, you know. Like, he's a little bit Thomas from Deadly Premonition, and he's a little bit every other side character from every other JRPG ever. But yeah, we talk to him, and then we go back to the prison, where Ike is of course about to die from getting poisoned, but he then takes the antidote and he's fine. And now it's like 22 in the evening. And yeah, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Well, it will be tomorrow for me and 10 seconds for you. I'll see you.
Yes. Hello. It is the 7th of June. And it is our day 7. Our 7th day. And we are of course returning to Shadow of Memories. And um, I don't know. I'm excited to see what uh, this chapter is going to hold. The plots uh, thickened quite a lot last time, so that's exciting. We're doing the sixth chapter because there was a zeroth chapter. Fuck you, Japan. I'm just kidding, I love you and your video games. Okay, so yeah, that was chapter 7, yes. And in this one, a little more time has passed yet again. And something is beginning to kind of grab my attention. It's that Ike, every time he avoids getting murdered, just kind of fucks about for a little bit. And this time is no exception, because he ends up stopping at one of those movie poster things, where two ladies are looking at the movie, and they don't think it's super interesting, so they go away. Then Ike goes up to look at the movie poster, he sort of contemplates the title, which is The Meditating Man. And then he gets run over by a car. He then travels back to 1980, and here he's actually accosted by the movie director, who is meditating, hence why it's called The Meditating Man up until this point. He then asks Ike some questions, which I actually got wrong. Because what I did was that I told him that he should make a movie about a time traveler who was trying to do it for world domination. Then what ended up happening was that the young Mr. Eckhart's wife, who we know got murdered and the baby disappeared, she ends up getting killed. And then... And then... Um, and then I didn't time travel back to 2001, so uh, the director man never saw me actually time traveling. But what happened instead was that I went back to 1980. I answered the question about... I, I talked to the director of who will direct The Meditating Man. And I then accurately described what it is that Ike's adventure is about. It's a time traveling thriller, maybe love story. And what happens is that young Mr. Eckhart's wife, of course, gets shot and the baby gets taken away. And uh, Ike has tried to warn her before this happens. Um, so when he shows up to the murder scene, some townspeople are suspicious of him and sort of corner him. And then he, then, then he travels back to the present time just before he was murdered. And because he travels back, the director who will direct The Meditating Man sees him time travel and then starts writing the movie that will eventually become a different movie, which is an exciting time travel tale, which will mean that the ladies who are standing in front of the movie poster will actually keep standing there and that will create too many witnesses for the car to run Ike over, so it doesn't run him over. And he survives yet another murder assassination attempt or whatever. And what happens finally is that Mr. Eckhart in the present time uh, asks him for a book back, which is what we're going to do now in the next chapter tomorrow. What is interesting about this is that while we're trying to stop the young Mr. Eckhart's wife's murder, we actually first observe the murder, then we travel back just minutes before it happened and try to stop it, which we can't, which is why we end up traveling to the um, end up traveling forwards in time, which is why the uh, director sees us. While we're actually traveling back to the the present time, the humunculus says that, you know, we, some things just can't be changed. Which is, uh, I believe that's confirmation for everything that is... Everything that Ike changes, he was always supposed to change. It's called like... Ah, I can't remember what that form of time travel was called. It's, it's something. They're like different forms of time travel. Um, so this one basically means that uh, it follows the rules of the grandfather paradox. This is the kind of time travel where you can't go back and murder your grandfather. Because if you were supposed to go back and murder your grandfather, you would have already done it. We're just sort of along for the ride and trying to figure out how to do all the things that we're supposed to do. 
And I think the interesting thing about this game is, is that we actually end up existing in multiple timelines, but it seems that we were always supposed to sort of work our way through these multiple timelines, always supposed to change time a little by little by little by little. So I think that's an... I'm a little bit mind blown. Uh, yeah, the, the game is getting exciting. <laughs> and um, it will be more exciting tomorrow. Well, it will be tomorrow for me. It will be 10 seconds for you. I will see you then. It is the 9th of June and not the 8th of June because I was busy yesterday, but I'll play one chapter now and then I'll play one chapter tonight. So it will still kind of be 10 days in the shadow of memories, but um, without uh, further ado. Let's, uh, let's get into it. Mr. Eckert, are you there? <laughs> so yeah, that was of course another chapter. And this chapter starts with us going to meet Mr. Eckhart at the top of the tower. But when I get there, he gets pushed off the tower and then falls to his death and dies. What I then did was to go back to the night before, conclude that I needed a key to get into the tower, go to 1902 when the old Mr. Eckhart lives, and take the spare key to the tower, which I then used the night before to go into the tower, use an old rope to tie that to the railing on top of the tower so that Ike could um, hang on to that rope when he got pushed over the tower. And so I went back to the present and then let the event play out. However, what, uh, what happened was that the rope was also broke and then Ike died. So then I thought, well, I'm gonna get an older rope. And this is where the game sort of fell apart for a little while. You can't just go back to the 1900s and get the key. You have to conclude that the door is locked the night before, before you can go back to 1902 and get the key. This also sort of led me down the wrong rabbit hole of going... of not being able to immediately get the rope in 1902 because I was gonna get the rope when the rope was younger, because then it would hold. So I figured, well, I'll go to 1980, and the tower was open there, so I got the rope, which was 20 years younger, and I thought, well, it will hold this time. It did not. And then I went to the 1500s, and, you know, I couldn't get into the tower, so there was no rope. But then something happened, I did it all again. I went to 1902, I got the key, I went into the tower the night before, and from inside the tower I went to 1902 again, which took me to a different 1902 where I could go into the tower because I had the key and get the old rope, which was now the new rope, so I could go back, back, back to the night before, tie the rope around the railing and then go back or forwards to the place where I got killed then let the event play out and the rope actually held. Up until now the game has been fairly good about letting the player skip certain events if they knew where they were going. I don't know why it decided that I need to take each individual step how the game wanted the things to play out play by play. And I actually looked up a walkthrough and even the walkthrough sort of suggests that it is a weird that it's a weird chapter because it's the walkthrough for the chapter is like this short and for the other chapters they're like this long because they have so many variables and you can and if you have and you, if and if you have the solution you can do the chapter extremely fast but you can't with this one but it's still sort of my favorite chapter because we learn after Ike survives his assassination that Mr. Eckhart is the one that pushed him off the tower. And 
that doesn't mean that Mr. Eckhart is the murderer, because Mr. Eckhart didn't try and kill Ike all the other times. Mr. Eckhart only tried to push him off the tower, and he was told to do so by a young man. And the reason Mr. Eckhart did this was that Ike appeared at the crime scene 20 years earlier. And uh, Mr. Eckhart, of course, thought that Ike was, you know, Ike's father in 1980, so he was like, I'm gonna take it out on his son. But after he pushed uh, Ike off, he instantly regretted it and he sort of admits to everything. Um, and we learned that there's like a young man on the phone that's telling him to do stuff. Which is of course the humunculi. And I also, didn't, I also knew that Mr. Eckhart wasn't the, um, the killer because of course the humunculi is the killer. Because Ike is gonna be revealed to be the humunculi's creator and is sort of like a... Thing for humunculi to always kill their creators, I think. So yeah, that was that chapter. Um, we will continue chapter 9 later today. Well, it will be later today for me. It will be 10 seconds for you. <laughs> Yeah, so, hello, it is, um, the 13th of June, and it's been quite a few days since I, um, last played. Um, summer just kind of arrived, and I got busy. But we are continuing, and it's gonna be... It's still gonna be 10 summer days in the Shadow of Memories. But, yeah, because I, I've only, yeah, it's still gonna be 10 days in the shadow of memories, but it's gonna be all on this, over the span of way longer. I'm gonna do chapter 9 today, which is Saturday, and then I'll hopefully get to do chapter 10 tomorrow, which is Sunday. Um, because I think they are gonna be long. I'm only two and a half hours into a four and a half hour game, so I figured they're gonna be each an hour long. So yeah, let's uh, let's stop rambling and let's get into it. I got a pocket full of hawthorns. Hawthorns. <laughs> to show up unannounced, don't you? Father's down in the basement working. You did come to see him, not Margaret, didn't you? Oh, stop it. Uh. Mm. So, okay, um, Ike goes back to the 1300s where he runs into Dana at uh, the, uh, the painting man's house. Um, no, wait, yeah, okay, so Ike goes back to the alchemist, talks to him, he needs the Philosopher's Stone. He then goes to the painting man's house because he learned in the future that Dana was painted with the Philosopher's Stone. And he actually runs into Dana the day before the painting was painted. And she gives him the Philosopher's Stone. And Ike tries to convince her to, uh, to go back with him to the future. But she's been in the Middle Ages for around four years. And she's actually sort of found a good life there. People in this time care about her and they appreciate her in a way that she didn't... In a, in, a, in a way that they didn't in her modern life. She actually says that, you know, that she thought about how in the... Mo she thought about in modern times how she could just disappear one day and no one will notice except her boss. And that is true. Uh, but I guess we could do some stuff and with Mr. Eckhart and go retrieve her in, the 19, in 1979. Because she has to be the baby that disappears. Because their names are similar. Well because, well, because their names are the same and they are born there and they are the same age, of course. And Dana's mother, well, uh, the mother that also dies looks exactly like Dana. 
And we know that's a theme because the squire looks like Mr. Alfred and Mr. Alfred look, looks like Mr. Eckhart. And then we end up in modern times and we discover that Hugo has been following us and is the one that has been trying to murder us. He's actually the voice that we heard Mr. Eckhart arguing with and the one that threatened Mr. Eckhart. He then shows up in our time at the town square and is threatening Margaret and he's threatening to stab her. And I guess Hugo sort of knows that uh, Ike is related to, the, to their family family because otherwise I don't know why or maybe he just or maybe he just thinks that Ike wants to f wants to bang his sister which is also a possibility um, what's interesting is that we go back in the past and we start the experiment with the alchemist um, we then return after the experiment is done and we discover that he has left notes his alchemy notes um, and that he has left his alchemy notes in his lab and he's not there anymore so we take the alchemy note and we burn them and then Hugo and Margaret walk down the stairs and they discover the notes but they are so charred that uh, that they can't read them so that way Hugo never reads the notes he never learns that he he never learns that it's possible to build a homunculus or even that a homunculus exists and therefore he will never build a time machine that he will then use to chase after Ike. What then happens is that Ike then travels back to the prison where um, Hugo and Margaret then fade out and disappear. Then, you, then the homunculus shows up and we learn that the entire reason this plot happened was that the homunculus, the homunculus wanted to close its loop and make sure that it survived. So the homunculus actually takes our digipad and uh, then it just leaves us stranded in the present time without any answers. We then get a flashback to the 1300s and it's where we see uh, Dr. Wagner complete the experiment and we learn that the homunculus is actually a demon and that Dr. Wagner didn't create the demon, he just thought he did but he accidentally just awoke the demon. However, he kind of knew this, I guess, because he has created a pentagram on the ground and actually trapped the demon. And because of that, uh, he sort of trapped within the grasp of the demon because when you summon a demon you automatically sell your soul to that demon. But the demon won't actually claim the soul until you are dead. So what Dr. Wagner does is that he wish, wishes for eternal youth and unending life. And this is where it gets kind of cool, because guess who the fuck Dr. Wagner is? He is Ike. And he is trapped in this loop with the demon, where the demon constantly has to protect Ike from getting killed, because if he doesn't then Ike will never travel back in time and make sure that his previous self, which is Dr. Wagner, makes the demon. But the demon can never really escape because it's trapped, I think. This is ending D, which is the sort of like neutral ending where you just continue the loop. And tomorrow I think we're gonna explore the other endings because I read that you can sort of just go back a few chapters and change a few things in chapter 7 and chapter 8 and actually unlock most of the other, other endings. So I think we're gonna do that tomorrow. And that's gonna be really exciting because I think there's like a little like a little love story with Dana that can be unlocked. I think what my theory is that we can make sure that none of this ever happens and then Dr. Wagner and Dana live happily ever after. And there's also some interesting thing about uh, Margaret probably being the seer that we visit in present day at the start of the journey. But all that is gonna be tomorrow. Yeah. Cool. I'm very excited. <laughs>
so um it's been a while since i said that i would be back for day 10 where i would revisit the sort of the other endings and i've sort of been thinking about it and i'm not gonna do that because i watched all other seven endings and they are pretty much all kind of bonkers right and i think and because they have so different requirements i actually think that it would totally ruin the experience if i told you about them and uh, slash if i showed them to you because just discovering them is like super fun and it's not just that you take a few choices that you like that you do one thing differently in like the last chapter or maybe one of the beginning chapters no no like you fundamentally have to change how you played the game the first time around to get a new ending and one of them is of course an ending where you can just stop it all from happening which i think is brilliant as shit um so yeah Shadow of Memories, it's, it's... It's fantastic. It's like... It's really fucking good. Um, and... Uh, I seriously enjoy my... Sort of... 10 very spread out days with it. It's been great! But, as you can see... It is... Uh, It's also great for for sailing, which is what I'm doing now. Um, so yeah, go play Shadow of Memories. And uh, I don't normally do call to actions in my videos because I think that kind of like cheapens them or whatever. But please do comment what ending you got and what you think you did to get it because I feel like this bunch of different things that you can do different and get different endings and i would like to see where you made some some different choices compared to me yes so let me know what ending you get and please do go play it even if it's on an emulator it's like three hours long it's it's nothing and it's a brilliant little game that's from a time when games were just when average games were good let me put it like that so yeah um enjoy summer even though it's not summer today it was yesterday though and it will be again tomorrow but the great thing is that i get the beach and the ocean to myself well i always have the ocean to myself but i get the beach to myself not that i'm on the beach but i guess less i get less people staring at me because i'm an idiot that's in the middle of the water holding a phone yeah so yeah